We're now going to listen to our first reading. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're now going to hear our Gospel reading. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John, reading from chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you will have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We're now going to hear Peter Williams preach. This morning we're going to be looking at one of the, one of the many wonderful stories uh, that comes out of the resurrection. It's about doubting Thomas. I'm a doubter. When t people talk about incredible things, I want credible evidence. 
And, and that's why I, I always think uh, that Thomas and I and many others of you uh, would have a lot in common. Like the other disciples, Thomas often failed to understand what Jesus was saying. But unlike them or often, he was ready to blurt out the fact that he'd failed to understand. So when Jesus explains that he's going to prepare a place for his disciples, he says, you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas is uncomprehending. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Uh, Thomas may also have been a bit of a loner. At any rate, he was not with the other disciples when Jesus appeared to them. And when they told him about this, his reaction was exactly that of an evidence-seeking person. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And that brings me to the importance of evidence. Evidence. We've been brought up to understand the need for evidence, uh, particularly in our world uh, for scientific and for historical evidence. And that's exactly what Thomas wanted. And remember that the first century was every bit as sceptical about the idea of resurrection uh, uh, as we would be. And indeed, that's why the disciples were huddled away in an upper room. The idea that Jesus might have risen from the dead simply never entered their heads, any more than would have entered our heads. When something entirely incredible happens, then we rightly demand very strong evidence that it really happened in the way that people are claiming that it happened. And that's exactly what Thomas was doing. He wanted the crucial evidence. And he was right to want the crucial evidence. And that's why the Gospels give so much space to providing the hard historical evidence. And, and what is obvious from their accounts is that the resurrection was a totally unexpected happening. All the historical evidence indicates that, indicates that they had absolutely no inkling that Jesus' crucifixion was anything more than a cataclysmic tragedy. And we see that in Thomas. He was, like them all, or they all have been in despair. Jesus represented the smashing of all his dreams. But the evidence uh, of the other disciples that Jesus had been raised from the dead simply did not stack up. And that's why he made his famous statement that he would not believe until he could see and feel the actual nail marks in Jesus' hand and side. Unless, that is, he could see the hard evidence. A week went by. And the disciples were again together in the upper room. This time Thomas was with them. And then the risen Jesus appears. And you may have noticed that he uses the, his familiar greeting, Peace be with you. And then he reached out to Thomas in a way that directly met his evidence seeking. Put your finger here. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. And what's important here is that Jesus reached out to Thomas's mind. He showed Thomas the evidence. But he also reached out to Thomas's heart. He called him not only to see the evidence, but to meet with him person to person. And that invitation to meet with Jesus person to person shows us how head and heart are always part of any fulfilled relationship. Sure, some people will have more head than heart and other people will have more heart than head. But meeting Jesus will always be more than mind to mind. It will nearly always be more than heart to heart.
When we fall in love, no doubt, uh, sometimes we look for, and indeed if we're wise, we look for evidence to back our love. Is he or she right? Does she tick all, he, she tick all the boxes? But being in love is something more than the calculation of the head. It's a clicking of heart to heart. It's a step of faith. Thomas was convinced first in his head and then in his heart. Once he met with Jesus, he knew that he, he had hereafter to commit himself to Jesus as Lord. Listen to those moving words, my Lord and my God. And in those five words, we are close to understanding what the risen Christ should mean to us. And don't forget that Thomas could have been convinced by the resurrection without making a commitment to Christ as Lord. Apparently, in a survey done a little while ago, something like 57% of British people say that they believe in the resurrection. But we know that nothing like that number are committed to Christ as their Lord and God. Look at the historical evidence for the resurrection and like multitudes of people down the centuries uh, you may be convinced. But remember that a conviction that a man rose to the dead does not necessarily lead to commitment to following the resurrected Lord. Uh, to return to the love but it's a little bit like the difference between being convinced in our mind that love exists and being willing to follow from the bottom of our hearts uh, a commitment to love somebody else exclusively. Doubting Thomas committed himself to following the Lord. And one last point in, uh, from our story. Thomas had to respond to Jesus' very direct challenge. Jesus said to him, stop doubting and believe. In other words, Thomas had to make a decision, a decision of the will to follow Jesus, a decision to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus. And remember how personal are Thomas's words, my Lord and my God. Do they not flow with spontaneous emotional commitment? And for Thomas, this meant starting life in a new and in a fresh way. Jesus sometimes spoke of it as being born again. It was a radical, fresh start. And that call to a radical, fresh start to follow Jesus as Lord and Saviour is what I want to challenge us with this morning. Are we able to say, my Lord and my God, are we following Christ as Lord and Saviour of our lives? What does following Christ as Lord and Saviour mean? St. Margaret's Westminster is often called the parish church of the House of Lords. It's had many uh, famous people associated with, but in, in recent years, uh, uh, guy who's been mo both famous and infamous is Jonathan Aiken and and he was once talked about as uh, a rising Prime Minister and he tells us I called myself a Christian without actually being one. I was strong on the externals. I went to church fairly regularly. I supported Christian causes. I was even a church warden in St. Margaret's Church. However, I do not think I had fully appreciated the simple truth that being a Christian has little to do with external appearances and everything to do with the eternal, with the internal commitment of the heart. It is that internal commitment to the heart of the heart to follow Christ that Thomas made. And that's why Thomas remains a challenge to us all, a challenge for some to remake a commitment to follow Christ that we made some time ago but have let slip, a challenge for others to follow Christ for the very first time, a challenge for yet others 
uh, to witness to the fact that they are following the, the Lord as uh, Christ as Lord and Saviour. Let's just pray. My Lord and my God, we thank you for those words, Jesus to Thomas. We ask that you will enable us to echo them in our hearts as we respond to the risen Lord who stands before us. Amen.